Okay, continuing on. Chapter 14, Grace and Promise. Genesis 3, God intervenes with grace. Genesis 3, 8 through 21. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord uh, of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said to him, Where art you? And he said, Or where art thou? He, and he said, I heard the voice in the garden. I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Uh, have you eaten from the tree whereof I commanded you not to eat from? Or not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom <laughs> I love how I, I love this this verse because it it, it just it's like the blame is pushed down farther and farther, you know? So, and, and the only way, or the only way it stops is from the serpent. So I just kind of find that interesting. And the man said, the woman whom you gave me, <laughs> gave to me with me, um, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this <laughs> that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. I'm sorry I'm laughing, but it's just funny how, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, I did it, but he made me do it. And then, well, no, she made me do it. Or no, no, first it's, she made me do it. Okay, well, then he made me do it. <laughs> no responsibility whatsoever, you know what I mean? I just find that funny. Sorry, I, I know I'm goofy. <laughs> Okay, and the woman, uh, the woman God said said to the woman, the Lord God said to the woman, "What is, uh, what is this you have done?" And the woman said, "The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat." And the Lord God said to the serpent, "Because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle, <coughs> excuse me, and above every beast of the field. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life." And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise your heel and you shall bruise his heel. <coughs> and to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception in sorrow. For you shall bring forth children and your desire shall be to your husband and you shall rule over you and he shall rule over you and unto adam he said because you have hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and have eaten of the tree of of which i commanded you saying you shall not eat of it cursed is the ground for you or for your sake in sorrow shall you eat of it all the days of your life thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to uh to you and you shall eat the herb of the field in the sweat of your face shall you eat bread till you return unto the ground for out of it was uh were you taken and the dust <clears throat> uh and the dust you are and unto dust shall you return and adam called his wife's name eve because she was the mother of all living Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. That is a long verse to read. I will tell you that right now. <laughs> and I was trying to say it a little because every, every time I look at the these and thous and stuff like that, it doesn't make sense to me. So I have to do it to, way, to how it makes sense. And I know what those mean. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not trying to change the 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 wording of, of the Bible or anything like that and put my own in there. I'm saying I'm just using the terms of today you know what i mean i don't know anyway moving on this section is quite familiar and sometimes such familiarity can numb us rendering us unable to see anything new or gain any aspiration or inspiration excuse me man's perception due to his fall has now altered oh let me read that again this section is quite familiar, and sometimes such familiarity 
can numb us, rendering us unable to see anything new or gain any inspiration. Man's perception due to his fall has now altered or yeah, has now altered his connection. Excuse me. I'm having a hard time reading y'all. Sorry. His condition has changed, especially his relationship with God. We've discussed how, however, since the fall, man has been hiding in fear when it comes to the presence of God. I believe even the tone of God's voice sounded different. When Adam heard the voice of his friend walking in the garden, he hid himself. Considering what I know about Mount Sinai and how God appeared in his glory and how terrifying that was for the people of Israel, I believe that because man is gripped with a spirit of bondage, fear, condemnation, weakness, death, morality, and corruption, he cannot bear the presence of God. It's a terrifying thing. However, it's God who took all the steps to rectify this. There is nothing man can do to deal with God. God had, uh, God had to intervene. In the Old Testament, we see him do this in dramatic ways. For example, he instituted the priesthood and the tabernacle, which served as a buffer between him and the people he wanted to interact with. In this way, he could have... Or in this way, he could still make a way to bless fallen people. God's intention is still to bless man. God did not revoke the blessing, nor did he retract the fact that creating man was good. He created man in his image and likeness, and he wants man to have dominion. Death entered the picture due to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There is nothing man can do to rectify this situation by himself. He is dead. Amen. It is all up to God to intervene now. The next move has to be God's. Amen. Amen. Returning to the aftermath of Adam and Eve's actions, their perspective underwent a drastic transformation. One account, one account, accustomed to walking alongside God in the serene coolness of the day. Now they cowered in terror. They're once accustomed, sorry, once accustomed to the walking alongside God in the serene coolness of the day. Now they cowered in terror, dreading his voice and concealing themselves in fear. It's likely that the sight of God's presence has historically evoked such profound reactions this or excuse me think of think of the prophets like ezekiel jeremiah or isaiah when faced with god's presence they fell uh prost prostrate as if lifeless only to gather strength to stand once again as to whether god manifested his glory or appeared in human form during this incident the, spe uh, the specifics remain uncertain, though my inclination leans toward his glory. Reflecting on my past encounter with a Hebrew-English Bible, its words conveyed an extraordinary potency. The sound of God's voice echoed through the rock akin to a majestic passage of glory. The Hebrew language captures this image in a more vibrant manner. As they discerned his approach, an overwhelming terror enveloped them. Their future was shrouded in uncertainty, fear casting a long shadow. Their experience seemed akin to standing before the awe-inspiring judgment seat. Remarkably, even in the midst of their trepidation, God ex, uh, extended his grace. Let's consider this analogy. Envision yourself on death row, ac acutely aware that your execution date approaches. Suddenly, a reprieve arrives, the death sentence commuted to a lifetime 
behind bars. Relief or relief surges unless an inexplicable desire for death persists. Such a parallel could be drawn to our human existence. A mortal coil akin to a prison term, replete with life's sorrow, afflictions, uh, afflictions, suffering, and groaning. God subjected the entire creation to a state of futility, resulting in persuasive sorrow. Romans 8, 20 and 22, or 20 through 22. Nonetheless, even within sorrowful lies and potential for solace, 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4, God assumes the role of comforter, a compassionate father, and the source of all mercies. Psalm 86, 15, 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4. Jesus fulfills the role of comforter, John 14, 16. Joined by the Holy Spirit, as another advocate of solace, solace, John 14, 26. Throughout the history, God's prevailing intention has been one of grace. Despite the tumultuous events that have unfolded, his overarching plan for, hum for humankind remains intact. Ephesians 1, 9 through 10. Progressing in the native Progressing in the narrative, the sequent act of God is one of grace. We may be too familiar with this story, but our familiarity is with the retelling of it rather than the details of the account itself. We've encountered images from art of Adam and Eve bearing the weight of a curse departing the sanctuary of the garden for a cursed, desolate expanse. We've been told that this was where divine judgment was pronounced was pronounced upon them. Yet this portrayal is only partial. The story uh, divulges a nuance often overlooked despite the proclamation that death would befall them on the very day they consumed the forbidden fruit. They didn't die. Moreover, God was attuned to their vulnerability, their nakedness shrouded in shame, and so he provided cover. By doing so, he sanctioned, to, he, he sanctioned taking an animal's life, the first death, to drape them in its skin. This event serves as a visual embodiment of uh substitutionary atonement memorized shortly or memorialized excuse me memorialized shortly after in Abel's role as a shepherd which foreshadowed the Levitical sacrificial framework amidst disclosing the curse that loomed God also imparted a promise that of the gospel the seed destined to crush the serpent's head a cherub was placed not to irrevocably bar access to the tree of life, but to watch over the path to the tree of life. Mm. Amen. Following their expulsion from Eden, Adam and his partner, now named Eve, meaning mother of all living, born, uh, bore fruit. Upon the birth of their first son, she announced that she had begotten him of the Lord. Within them resided a sense of vitality and even blessing. Recall that within Eden, <coughs> excuse me, recall that within, within Eden, they were blessed and instructed to multiply. Clearly, some blessing remained. In reflection, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. In due course, God dispatched his son to perish for the ungodly during a time when we were utterly feeble. Romans 5, 6. Amen. This encap encapsulates God's move in grace, instantaneously bestowing the gospel, uh, prof pro mm, proffering? Okay, we'll go with that. Uh, proffering an unwavering hope and 
bestowing eternal life. Titus 1, 2, and 3, 7. There's solid, uh, uh, solitary task is to embrace God's promise through faith, to assert that grace is absent from the Old Testament is to be a fallacy or is, uh, wait, to assert that grace is absent from the Old Testament is be a fallacy. Here in the first pages of the Bible, grace resounds, re, or resounds loud and clear. Y'all, I am struggling today, so please bear with me. I apologize. I don't know what's going on with my mouth and my brain. It just is not working. I don't, I must be having, I don't know, uh, just not working today, <laughs> but whatever. Praise God. Um, I can even read in the first place, but I really, 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 really encourage those who can get this book and read it for themselves and not only read it normal, like a normal person, other than listening to me, I know some of you can, uh, you have, and, and you can't, which I understand. So I, again, I ask you, bear with me. Um, I have good days and I have bad days for those who, uh, are new to my channel. Um, I, you know, right now I sound like a fifth grader trying to read and it happens. So again, I do ask that you bear with me. Um, but if seriously, if you don't want to listen to me babble like this or anything like that, I encourage you to get the book at christiansofthegospel.com. Everything's in the description box and, um, you know, just enjoy it on your own. <laughs> but I do enjoy the fellowship. I will say that, uh, even though I suck at doing it. So it doesn't matter because it's all about Christ and not about me. So, amen. Okay, moving on. Um, God first gave Adam and Eve the gospel to hold on to. That started the whole program of grace that we are now standing in. Amen. God has become a man. He died, resurrected, became the spirit or sent the spirit. He became a life-giving life spirit according to... To 1 Corinthians 15, 45, and breathed himself into us. Now he's our life, and he says, abide in me. His life is in us. He's in charge of the life. We are to abide. But even that, we're weak. We tend to drift. We tend to get distracted through immaturity, lack of understanding, through deception, and all kinds of stuff. Or some also... Uh, infirmities that can kind of distract you as well. Um, we have a high priest who intercedes for us. We have the body of Christ and the ministry of the New Testament. Amen. He's given us all kinds of things. He intercedes for us and he shepherds us. So even the abiding eventually comes from him. Amen. Amen. I think a lot of times, and I know this is true for me and, uh, before I really understood the nature and the just grace was Christ himself um, as our advocate and as our high priest and as our shepherd and everything, um, our everything in a nutshell. Uh, he is our everything in a nutshell. I think we tend to think that we because let me ask let me ask somebody this when you first got saved it's like you felt like you did you feel like you owed God something like you saved me you were so grateful and everything and it's like now I need to do something for you did anybody else have that I'm I'm just curious because I did for many many years and I felt so inadequate because of it because I couldn't live up to the standards that were supposedly I was supposed to live by, you know, and that comes from, you know, pulpit puppets and just babes themselves um, that really didn't need to be teaching. And again, I'm not a teacher. However, I understand a lot more than and I'm not saying this to brag, okay? I don't mean this in, in, in a in a 
in a bragging way. I'm just saying that I've, uh, how do I say this? Um, Holy Spirit has helped explain that the Word of God is not a, um, a burden to read or a, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, a, um, a map, to, I don't want to say a map. What am I trying to say here? Um, like rules to follow, okay? And if you don't follow those rules, you don't get the blessing or you don't get, you know, it's, it's not a carrot and stick type of thing. But yet growing up and for many, many years as an adult, that's how I believed it because that's how I was taught. So it's like been ingrained in all of us to think that we owe God something. But then you have the opposite where you have those that think that they're so self-righteous and think that they're so, you know, the cat's meow, um, that God owes them something because he's, because they're supposedly doing so much for him and they get irritated and angry and kind of, you know, I don't know, just throwing it in people's faces. I've done so much for God and, you know, but yet I'm humble about it. You know, the fake humbleness type of thing. I don't know if I'm making sense or not, but I was just curious if anybody else had that where they felt so grateful to, to have salvation. And even today, I, I, I feel that, but I don't have the burden of, oh, I have to give him something back, you know, when I know that I have nothing to give him because I don't need to. He, it, the work is already done. Everything is complete. I know that I am 100% uh, covered under the blood and justified by that blood and his righteousness has uh, qualified me for the blessing and for the inheritance and you know um, the peace that only he can bring to enjoy uh, live the Christian life through enjoying Christ every day you know, and just knowing that it's just the truth, the identity truths that we have in Christ and just walking by them. I mean, that's how we walk through this life today. We walk by the spirit and not by the flesh. The flesh is, <clears throat> you know, it's not just the, the, like David says, it's not just the naughty part, <clears throat> excuse me, not just the naughty parts and everything, but it's also the, um, uh, the, re the, the religious contents thinking, you know, of, I have to do this for God so I can get the blessing or I'm, um, or thinking that you're doing something for God and you're really not doing it for them. You're basically doing it for yourself, you know, um, He has to make the first move. If it if it's something that he wants you to do, it's going to be him doing it through you. It ain't going to be in your flesh. It ain't going to be through your strength. Because you have no strength. We have no strength. Our strength comes from Christ. Our jo The joy of the Lord is our strength. And that's what the legalists do not understand. And I might do a video later. Um... Because I had a, uh, I have a relative that is a legalist that I don't get along with very well. Most of you know who I'm talking about. Well, I, you know what? Screw it. It's my mother. Okay. And my mother and I do not get along very well at all. Uh, even though she thinks we do. We don't. Because she is a big time legalist. She is a stubborn ass. That I get that from her as well, but um, I lean more towards my dad's side of working 
working myself to death type of thing. Um, whereas my mother's stubbornness is in thinking that she has to do something for God in order to be in his good graces, like going to church, you know, um, she feels, she tells me, oh, I haven't been in church in so many years and everything, and I just feel so bad. And every single time I tell her, but anyway, I don't want to, I don't want to get into it because I'll, I'll go off again. <laughs> it's just, she drives me insane. She literally makes my blood pressure go up and stresses me out. So I don't talk to her very often because that's all I hear. And it, I, I don't want to hear it. You know, I'm sorry. I don't. Um, anyway, I'm babbling again. So rest in Christ because that's all he wants for us to do is to enter into the the garden of Christ, you know, the, the, uh, what do you call it? the, the temporary garden for this life that we can rest in through our death with Christ being crucified with him, knowing that we are complete in him. And when we get our glorified bodies and everything, then we will have the, well, I shouldn't say then. We're already complete in him, but I'm saying, you know, living this life, living the Christian life is not living it by the book of James, okay? It's the book of Galatians, Romans, and, every, and all the teachings of Paul that bring us into that garden. It's not through the book of James, okay? Not saying that James is not a brother and everything, and I know I'm totally getting off topic again. Um, but, and that's another thing that, you know, she thinks that the book of James is like up on a pedestal and, um, I don't, I don't, I don't know. No, 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 no. I lived that for many years and it was miserable and she's miserable. She's 100% miserable and you can hear it in her voice and it's sad because I, it's just, it's frustrating because she will not listen at all. Um, I don't remember where I was going with that. Basically, just rest in Christ. Rest in Christ and his finished work and leave everything else up to him. And just enjoy getting to know him. That is the best advice that I can give as living the Christian life. Faith to faith. That is it. So... Okay, I'm done.